to the book of Colossians chapter number three. The book of Colossians chapter number three. What we're going to talk about on this morning is something that is not talked about very much in church settings. And today I do believe that the Lord is leading us in this direction for a reason. And I'm going to do my best to keep this rated PG. But as we, pref as we get into this, I would just like to say uh, viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3 beginning at verse 5. Let us read out loud together. And it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now we are also to put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. And we're going to talk to you on a subject I title, Inordinate Affection. Yes. Say this out loud with me. Say, Inordinate Affections. Inordinate Affections. Now, this passage of scripture is written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae. And he was addressing saints, Christians, people who believe in God, people who have given their life to the Lord. But he felt it necessary to remind them that as Christians, we need to mortify, everybody say mortify. mortify. Therefore, your members, it's not talking about church members now. No, he said mortify because mortify means to kill, to put to death, to consider it null and void. Even sometimes it means to ignore something. Right? So that's what mortify is all about. To put something aside, put it to death as though it doesn't exist. And then he said, mortify what? Your members. Members having to do with the parts of our bodies. Now he's not telling us to literally cut off our arm or cut out our eyes or anything like that. He's saying that because we still have the residue of sin in our flesh, even after we've been born again, we still have the sin nature in our flesh. So that's the reason why he says, because you have the sin nature in your flesh, as Christians, you need to cause your flesh to be mortified. In other words, bring your flesh under subjection to the spirit. So this is not an easy thing. Because there's temptation in the flesh. How many of you realize that even as a Christian, you're going to have temptations? So temptations are there because the nature of sin is still in your flesh. Not in your spirit if you're born again, but in your flesh. And so there are things that he begins to name that will give you all kinds of troubles especially if you have ever engaged in any of these any of these behaviors before you were saved because the devil is always going to tempt you with the things that you were involved in before you got saved are y'all here today so some of these things may not tempt some people because they might not have ever been engaged in these things when they were out in the world but he's saying just in case I'm going to make mention to you that things such as fornication, fornication meaning any sexual relationships uh, or intercourse outside of the marriage vows. In other words, anything having to do with sexual intercourse with someone you're not married to, that's called fornication. He said, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't be doing this. He also mentions uncleanness. What is uncleanness? Well, uncleanness means unhealthy habits. Everybody say unhealthy habits. Unhealthy habits. 
Now, there are some people who have some very unhealthy habits. Uncleanness comes from the unclean spirit. You see, there's unclean spirits or demon spirits that are considered unclean and they, they minister to people and people have trouble being clean and tidy. They have some habits that are unclean. So spirits love to dwell in places that are untidy, dirty, nasty, dead. They like to be around dead things. Notice the demonic man in the Bible who was in the graves and he was running around in the cemeteries naked and he was, he was demon possessed. Why? Because demons love being around things that are dead. They love being around things that stink. They love being around things that, that's, that's nasty and untidy. So that's why as Christians, we ought to be more like God. The Bible, uh, or actually you hear an old saying where it talks about godliness is, or, or cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, it's not a, a scripture, but we have to understand God says, I am holy, so be ye holy, for I am holy. So he wants us to be like him, clean, and, and, and I, we are, we are genuine and pure. So this is the kind of nature that God puts in us when his spirit dwells in us. So he says, get away from uncleanness. Then he also says to stay away from something called evil concupiscence. <laughs> That's a word that we don't use every day. Concupiscence is actually sexual perversions. Any form of sexual perversion, and it is called evil concupiscence because it is, again, something that is fueled by demonic forces. You see, demons get involved in this. And so he says we are to what? Avoid evil concupiscence or sexual perversions. He mentions inordinate affections. The term inordinate means something that is not ordinary, something that is unnatural. In other scriptures, you will find it saying unnatural affections. So unnatural affections, such as homosexuality, uh, sex with animals, uh, sex with close relatives, sex with, uh, with, with, with women who are on their cycle. Also, it talks about for inordinate affections or inordinate uh, behavior is consuming poison. Well, times when people are, are, are drawn to consuming poison. Smoking is, is a poison. Uh, any use of drugs or, or excessive use of alcohol, that can be a poison to your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he says, you're not to place any kind of poisons in your body, things that you know is going to hurt you, things that's unhealthy. Also, it mentions uh, mutilating the body as an inordinate affection. How do people mutilate their body? Well, uh, the Bible talks about tattoos, cuttings, branding, and piercing. Also, devil worship. These are forms of devil worship, and many people don't even realize it. It's found in Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 20, and Leviticus chapter 21. All of these things that I just mentioned, they are inordinate affections. They are also called abominations. We're using some big words here, but they are abominations. Why? Because they are unnatural. God did not build us or design us for these things. And people wouldn't ever have thought of doing any of these things unless they had been involved in demon worship and devils, is, they're the ones that put these thoughts in people's minds. Originally, uh, these were placed in the minds of people when they began to use incense and get high <laughs> back in the many, many years ago, around the time of the Tower of Babel, when people were trying to, to, to hear from the gods, when they didn't they didn't believe in the one and only true and living God. They, they thought that he was going to try to bring a flood again and kill them. So they wanted to build a tower to get to heaven. And so the people began to uh, be led by a man by the name of Nimrod. 
And you find this back in Genesis chapter 11. And Nimrod was a great man in their sight. He was the emperor, uh, uh, the world's first uh, emperor. And he led people away from God. And when they were led away from God, they were led to worship devils. And these devils are who put those thoughts in people's minds. And they began to do these things and pervert everything that God had put on this earth and, and given to mankind as something beautiful. God said it is good, but the devil wanted to pervert the minds of people. And so the devil are energized by perversion. And as much as they can get their agenda across in the earth, they have to use a host. Most of the time it's going to be a human host because human beings have a certain level of intelligence that if they can use a human being to carry out their agenda, which is to bring utter perversion all over the world and to, and to bring chaos in the earth. So people have gotten involved in devil worship and these things that I just named are a part of devil worship. They are inordinate affections. They don't, they are not the things that God created us to do. And as I was saying earlier, real Christians will not practice these things. Real Christians will not practice these things. But the sin nature that's still in your flesh will give you a desire or something in you that will tempt you to be drawn into that. Let's look at verse number seven one more time. Verse number seven says, in which you what? Also walked, that's past tense, sometime. When you lived, past tense, in them. So that means that you don't live in it now. If you're born again now, you love the Lord now. This is not your practice. This is not your lifestyle. But these are the things that come to who? Verse 6 says, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So those who are the children of disobedience, the wrath of God is coming upon them because they have not committed their life to the Lord and they continuously live in these inordinate affections. And so the devil can use people who are not born again and they can go all the way into perversion and into the things that the devil can do to put these things in people's minds and they would have behaviors that are demonic. But we don't walk in that as Christians. So we are tempted. Everybody say we have temptations. We have temptations. But you have the ability to resist temptation. And that's what we're going to deal with in just a moment. But I want you to understand how temptations come. James tells us that we are tempted when we are drawn away of our own flesh and we are trapped in the things that we are drawn away to. God is not tempting us to do evil, but we are only tempted when we are drawn away of our own flesh and then we can get entrapped. So this really comes down to what do we really have control over and what we don't have control over. We can control some things. Two things that I want to mention that we can control. We can control what we are drawn to, and we can control what we think. Let me say that again. We can control what we're drawn to, and we can control what we think. Two things that we cannot control. We cannot control uh, what is attractive. When we see something that is attractive, we cannot control that because that's just a part of us. We, we are supposed to admire beauty. We're supposed to enjoy what God has put on this earth. So we cannot control seeing what is attractive, all right? And we cannot control appetite that is, that is built in. How many of you realize that you have appetites for things? Appetites is built into us because God meant for us to have appetite. In fact, appetite is something that is a sign of good health. But 
when we have appetites, we have to make sure that we are controlling the things that we can control. So we feel what we feel and we can't control our feelings, but we can control our behavior. Can y'all, are y'all following that? We cannot control how we feel about a thing, but we can control how we behave. In other words, there are some things that you might have a, a good feeling about or something that you like. Just because it is something that you like, it doesn't mean that you got to get it. There are a lot of things that we like, but it doesn't mean that it is necessary for us to have it. But appetite is good overall. We just need to know what to do with our appetites. That's where we're going right now. <laughs> when I said earlier about the things that we can control, we, we can't control what is attractive to us, but we can control being attracted to something. In other words, to be drawn to it. It may be something that looked good. It may be something that we would like, but we can control how much we desire it and how far we go to receive it or to get it. All right, I hope you're following along with me. I'm trying to take it slow. <laughs> and how we control things have to do with our mindset. Everybody say our mindset. What you think about and meditate on increases your desire for it. If you think about a thing, and you meditate on it, and you think about it over and over and over, the more you think about it, the more you will desire it. And so, when you desire it, you build up what is called an affection for it. Affection is a word that means to be attached to something or to be committed to something, to, to have a need for something. So when you have an affection for something, you feel like you've got to have it. You can't do without it. That's why the word tells us that we should set our affection on things above and not on the things beneath. We should set our affection on God and godly things. And why did he say set your affections? Well, to set your affection means that you put your mind on it. When you put your mind on it, your desire for it increases because you're thinking about it. You're meditating on it. And your desire grows and grows and grows. Unfortunately, people put their affection on the wrong things, things that are dangerous for us. Sometimes even the things that God calls inordinate affections. So you don't want to have inordinate affections. You want to have ordinary or natural affections for the things that are good. Inordinate things are the affections for things that's bad for you, that's, that is something that is that thing that God calls an abominable thing. Okay? Whatever it is that God has uh, said no to, those are the things that we should say no to. I want to love what God loves. I want to hate what God hates. Glory to God. Glory to God. So I don't want the inordinate affections. I want good affections. I want to have my affections on the things that are above. Come on. In Matthew chapter 5, verse number 28, it says that if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, that he has committed adultery already in his heart. Now, adultery means that a person has is trying is actually breaking covenant with someone that he already has covenant with now he is breaking a covenant so when we look at that scripture passage in Matthew 5:28 it says that when a man looks upon a woman to lust after her he has committed adultery already in his heart when you see the word woman here, it is the Greek word gune, which is spelled G-U-N-E, G-U-N-E, gune. And that word means wife. 
it can, be, it can be translated to the word woman or it can be translated to the word wife. So you can read it like this and say, when a man looks upon someone's wife to lust after her, he has committed adultery in his heart. It can be the other way around. He could be married and he looks upon another woman and he commits adultery now, this looking upon does not mean, oh, I saw someone and she is attractive. No, I mean, you can see a lot of people that are attractive. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about looking upon her with lust. Everybody say lust. lust. Now, lust <laughs> is, is a word that is different from appetite. Lust and appetite are not the same thing. Appetite you cannot control. Lust, you can control. That's the reason why he said, if he's looking upon this woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery in his heart because his intention is to get her, to have her. He is thinking on, I want to be with her. And he is then preferring her over his own wife. Therefore, he's committing adultery. You don't have to touch her. He don't have, you don't even have to come over to her or get close to her. But what's going on inside of him says in his heart, he's already committed adultery because what? God is not looking on the outward appearance, but God looks on the what? The heart. That means your deepest intentions and motives. That's your heart. So this man's motive would be, I want her. I prefer her over my wife. I want to do what I can to have her. So he is specifically wanting someone for himself. Another word for this is covetousness. Whenever you want something that is forbidden, it is called covetousness. And covetousness is the same thing as idolatry. We think of idolatry as bowing down to a statue, and most of us don't do that. But there are many ways that people are involved in idolatry. And so these things that I named earlier as inordinate affections, they really are in the category of idolatry, demon worship. And so when you are committing adultery, it is the same thing as covetousness. And the scripture tells us uh, in the Ten Commandments that we are not even to covet our neighbor's wife or anything that belonged to our neighbor. Amen? Amen. Uh, are y'all awake today? Amen. So covetousness is dangerous because again, it breeds destruction because you will be going to the place of destruction if you continue in that kind of a lifestyle. So once again, the word lust, it means strong desires. It means covetousness to desire something that is forbidden. Now, how does one develop affection or, or even love for anything? Well, there, there are four things I want you to note. Number one, you will see what you want. Number two, you will study it. Number three, you will make contact with it. And number four, you move to action in your behavioral changes. Now this can be anything. What you want, and I guess I could use for an example, uh, what if somebody, what if you want a boat? <laughs> What, what if you say, oh, I, 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 I saw a picture of a, of, a, of a motorboat that I want. So if I see a picture of the motorboat, now I want that motorboat. And the next thing you're going to do is you're going to start studying about that boat. You're going to look up stats about that particular boat. You're going to find out uh, uh, all kinds of things ab about it. Is it really going to serve your purpose? You might even uh, go to step number three, which is to make connection. Go, go to the store and put your hand on it and look at it and look it over. And the more you have contact with, the more you study it, the more you think about it, the more you're going to want it. And then the next thing you want to do is you're going to move to action to get it. You will stop at nothing to have what it is that you have now developed an affection for. Now, this can be anything. I just used a boat, for example. That could be a person. That could be activity. It could be a, a thing that you want. 
I mean, I, I, had, I had a situation, I, I can think about, there was a, a type of camera that I wanted. And so I did exactly that. I started studying about it. I read up on it. I, all of this before I ever purchased it. So I, I studied it and I, I spent time trying to find out about it and, and if it really what I want to fulfill my needs and what I needed it for. And so when I found out as much as I could, I moved to action. I had, the money, I had to get the money saved up to purchase that particular camera. So I moved to action until I what? Bought it, then possessed it. All right? Now, I had a purpose for it because I was going to use it for my business. Now, what if you have evil purposes for something? You can, per you can go through the exact same steps. If you have evil purposes for a thing, you'll end up doing the exact same thing, whether it's a good thing or whether it's an evil thing. All right? Guess what? This is how you fall in love. <laughs> you, you, you fall in love the same way. You see somebody that's attractive to you. And, you, and if, they are, if they are attractive, then what you do? You start to study them, find out about them. Sometimes you ask other people about them, even before you ever start talking to the individual. And then you do the same thing. You start making connection. You make contact. You get those seven digits, or however many it is now. <laughs> and, 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 and then you start calling them and, and making and contacts, and you're, you're, you're spending time with that individual. And you, you don't fall in love that's by walking down the street and then you just fall in love. No, it, 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 it actually takes a little time. Some people say, don't you believe in love at first sight? Well, that's lust, <laughs> because suddenly you want. Now, is lust really all bad? No. Sometimes you can lust for something good. The Bible even talks about whatever your heart lusts after. Because, see, lust is nothing more than strong desire. That's right. But you can have strong desire for something bad. You can have strong desire for something good. So if you have a strong desire for that individual, then you're going to go to the next step, and you're going to start trying to find out about that person. And then, before you know anything, you're calling yourself in love with that person. Why? Because now you have moved to action and you start and your behavior changes. Your behavior now is, is, is changed centered around how that person has come into your life. All of a sudden you, you're acting different. You're talking different. Why? You're thinking on different things. Your lifestyle maybe may start to alter in just a little bit. Why? Because you say you're in love with that person. Now you're bringing that person into your life and your life begins to make some changes. So that's how we, we get involved in that. Did you know that it's the same steps when you get addicted to something? If you get addicted to something, you have gone through the same steps. Somebody has introduced you to something and you see it and you got to want it first. Once you, you want it, you want to try it, then when you want it, and you want to try it, you go to the next step. What do you do? You start finding out everything you can find out about it. You start to try it out. And then you try it out, and you find that you like it. And then you start doing it over and over again. And now you're hooked on it. An addiction. Whatever it may be. A drug addiction. An alcohol addiction. A sexual addiction. It doesn't matter. Anything that you are addicted to. Always say to the Lord, I want to be addicted to your word, Lord. Let that be my drug. Let your word be my crack cocaine. Let your word be my, be my marijuana. I want to be as addicted to this word as a drug addict is to his drugs. You know what? It's the same thing when it comes down to things that you want to purchase, but it's also the th same thing when it comes down to you falling in love with God. You can, come to, you, you can come to know God and love God in the same way and develop affection for God That's right. following these exact same steps. Same step. See what you want. You know that, that God is what you want. You've been introduced to him. You've been introduced to a, a relationship to, with Jesus Christ. And then what do you do? You study his word. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Get, in, get involved in the, in the things of God. And so as you are studying and finding out more about him, the more you find out about him, the more you're going to want to make connection with him. To make connection with him means now I am, I am now involved in a relationship with God for myself. 
I've heard about him, I've studied about him, and now I have my own personal relationship with the Lord. And when I have my own personal relationship with the Lord, guess what? Your behavior starts to change because it is centered around your relationship with God. You start acting differently. Hello, somebody. Amen. We're about to wrap this up, but people have trouble with pornography because of inordinate affections. What is pornography? Pornography is defined this way. Images of a sexual nature that's designed to hold the attention of the viewer. Once again, pornography is images of a sexual nature that's designed to hold the interest or the attention of the viewer. So now there are people who will be drawn to it. Why? Because they are people who already have a, a, a low moral standard. There are people who have a low moral standard and they are drawn to things of this nature. Pornography, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's just, it's, it's nude bodies or, or whatever. It's in a, it's what? The sexual nature, anything of a sexual nature, if it's an image, whether it's video, whether it's uh, photos or something like that, it puts an image in the mind. And when you begin to focus on that image in your mind, it's going to do some things to you. It's going to start changing you. Did you realize that you can, when, when you see things, you start changing based on whatever is in your surroundings? <laughs> you adapt to your surroundings. You start, to, you start to become a part of the things that you see, the things that you listen to, the, the, the environment that you're in. You now begin to change your behavior to fit the environment that you're around. So that's why it's important that you have high standards. Because see, if you have high standards, you're gonna be attracted to things of high standard. But if you have low standards, you're going to be attracted to the things of low standards. So that means that you'll be attracted to perversion and you get involved in perversions. This is the result of people who are involved in pornography, viewing pornography on a regular basis. The result is to have the wrong view of the beautiful gift of expression of love that God has between a man and his wife. This is a gift that God has given to us and the devil wants to pervert it and to make it look like something filthy or nasty or dirty. These are unclean spirits that's dealing with people that's giving them the wrong view of what God has given to us that's one of the most beautiful gifts that he ever gave to mankind. And the devil wants to pervert it and make it look like trash. So that if you think of it as something trashy or dirty, then you're going to act accordingly. So what, what's, what's happening is persons who are getting involved in, in viewing pornography and they have this, this low moral standard and they get into perverted acts, that's really what it leads to. Because eventually, when you are what? When you're dealing with something long enough and you're, you're trapped in it, then it's going to change your behavior. And when your behavior begins to, 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 to change based on the things that's in your surroundings and the things that's in, that, that, that you're involved in, then you're going to start acting like a what? Pervert. <laughs> what is a pervert? A person who has their own personal view of something. God has given us vision and he wants us to see what he sees. He wants us to see things from his point of view. But when we can't see things from God's point of view, we see it from our personal view. And our personal view is lower than God's view because God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. Come on. So if God's thoughts and his ways are higher than ours, then we, that means we're way down here. But he's wanting us to do what? He wants us to come up so that we can have the mind of Christ. And if we have the mind of Christ, then we begin to see things the way God sees things. And we begin to see the beauty of sex. And we begin to, to recognize we can use it for the way God meant for it to be used. 
as a beautiful expression of love between a man and his wife. And a man being a male and the wife is a female. I know they're trying to change terms these days to make a, I heard a man talking about his husband the other day. Say, your husband? Come on now. That's, that, that, is, that is an inordinate affection and that is, that is one of those things that God uh, forbids. It is one of those things that is called an abomination in the sight of God because it's unnatural. Come on. So, other things that brings on inordinate affections. People who try to seduce other people by the way they dress and the way they carry themselves. These are people who have a, a low self-image of themselves. And so what they want is to be noticed. There are some people who uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they've been put down sometime in their life where they feel like uh, they're not smart or people don't see them as being a, a smart person or a, a, a person who is, is good at doing various things, a talented person. They're not noticed for those kinds of things. So oftentimes what a person will do is they'll have a low self-image of themselves and they figure, well, I got to get people to notice me because all of us like praise. All of us like to be, to be complimented. But some people would decide, well, I think the only thing I got going for me is I can look sexy. And so they start dressing in a way where they can draw people's attention to their flesh. Maybe they feel like they, they, don't, they don't look nice. Or, and if they don't, then what will they do? They'll put on a whole bunch of makeup and put on false hairs and put on all this false stuff. And, and they're trying to get people to notice them. And I'm not saying that everybody that wear makeup and all that, that, that that's the problem, that they have a problem. I'm saying that some people who do have a low self-image would do everything they can to be noticed. So sometimes they'll, they will put on tattoos and put them in places where nobody has any business looking. <laughs> Are y'all on planet Earth? <laughs> so why would somebody put a tattoo there? Because they want somebody to look at them there. They think that, hey, this is how I'm going to be noticed. This is how I'm going to get attention because I'm not getting attention for anything else. So maybe I can get attention for my looks. And it's not just females, sometimes it's males. Men are the same way. And so this is a, you have to understand, the devil puts these thoughts in your mind to make you think that this is the only way you're going to get somebody's attention. So they go out in public. Sometimes they take pictures and nude pictures and nearly nude pictures of themselves because they know somebody's going to look and somebody is going to have their attention drawn to that. But you have to understand what spirit it is behind that. There's a spirit behind that. It is not the spirit of God. In fact, we need to start thinking to ourselves, is this what Jesus wants me to do? Can I do this if Jesus is looking over my shoulder? Could I do this if I knew that Jesus was standing right next to me? This is what guides our motives. And this is what we really need to be thinking about is what is my motive for doing what I'm doing? If I have evil motives, then I know that it's not coming from God. If I have a motive to try to get attention drawn to my flesh, I know that's not coming from God. But if I want people to see me as a child of God, I got to look like a child of God. I got to carry myself like a child of God. I'm not saying you can't have any kind of, you know, makeup or anything like that or, or, or wear earrings or those, those type of things, especially if you're a woman, but do it in a moderate way. Because moderation means that I just want to, I want to be clean. I want to be neat. I want to carry myself in a professional way. Uh, and I want people to see me as, as someone of value, not someone that looked like trash. Nobody should want to look like trash. But oftentimes, that's what people think. And if I look like trash, then I'm going to attract somebody. But guess what? There was an old expression that says, trash will attract trash. Yes, will. Trash will draw trash. Yes, will. If somebody throws trash on the ground, somebody else is going to come along and they're going to say, oh, I guess that's the garbage can. They put it right there where somebody else put it. And so that trash begins to build up. Trash will attract trash. That's why we have to be cautious. If we're going to be children of God, we're not trash. 
We're not, we're, we're, we're not to look like trash or look like the world. We don't have to let the world set our standards. We let God set our standards, and we let our standard be holiness. Right. Everybody say holiness. holiness. And holiness means I am pure, I am genuine, I, I, I am of the truth. And I don't need all of this to get people's attention. If I'm going to draw someone's attention, they better be drawn to the God in me. They need to be drawn to, the, if, they, if, if, if I'm going to attract a man, if I'm going to attract a woman, whatever, they need to be drawn to the purity of holiness that's in me. They need to see Jesus in me. If they don't want Jesus, they don't want me. Come on, that ought, to be, that ought to be your lifestyle. That ought to be your slogan. If they don't want Jesus, they don't want me. Hello, somebody. Here's how we're going to close this out today. How are you going to combat the inordinate affections? If it's all about you having low standards, what you need to do is raise your standards. How do you raise your standards? First of all, make sure you're born again. Because we can't do anything without the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God, you are not His. And God cannot bring you up on the level you're supposed to be on except you have affection for Him. And when you develop affection for God, He pours His Spirit into you to give you all the help you need. He gives you the energy that you need, the anointing that you need to live a holy lifestyle. And so when you are born again, now you are able to raise your life standards. Now, how do you raise your standards? You will meditate on God's word day and night. As it says, and I believe it's Psalm 1, 1 and 2, where it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight is in the law of God in which he will, dwell, in which he will meditate in day and night. And he'll be like the tree that is planted by the river of water. That means you'll be a strong person. And that's what God is wanting us to be, is strong. If we're strong, we can resist the temptations. If, we are, if our standard is high, then our resistance to temptation is strong. If our standard is low, then our resistance is weak. So we want to raise our standard so that we will have strong resistance. Amen? How many want strong resistance? Amen. Glory to God. That's why the Bible lets us know that we have to know the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The next thing that is important as far as how you will combat the inordinate affections is that you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12 and 1 and 2 tells us how important it is that we are not conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So when we're meditating on the word of God day and night, reading his, his word, that don't mean that you just, you're just walking around in a daze all the time. It just means that what you have read earlier, when you, what you have studied earlier, what, what you have learned in church or whatever, you, you just take time and that throughout the day, you're constantly meditating on what God has taught you. God, should, God is talking to, all, talking to us all the time. And so all you can do is that you meditate on the Lord. Think about him. Have your mind on the Lord. No matter what you're doing, you can be working on your job or whatever you're doing. Focus on the things you need to focus on. But you have a, a godly mindset. But then you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can't renew your mind except you get in there and read and study the Bible. And get around other people who read and study the Bible. And have discussions about the Bible. The Bible even teaches us how important it is to have wholesome speech. Have wholesome speech. So first we say, be born again. Number two, meditate on God's word day and night. Number three, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And number four, have wholesome speech. Wholesome speech means that you're not cussing and you're not, uh, you know, you, using all this profane language and you're, you're not uh, uh, speaking uh, evil things and jesting and gossiping and lying all of these things the Bible says put those things away from you when you're mortify, mortifying 
your members of your flesh, what you're doing is you're putting these things to death. They are not to come up in your life. A man was shocked one time. I told him, I said, I hadn't cussed since 1982. He said, what, what? I, I said, oh, I, it, it doesn't come even to me to use curse words. And I'm not bragging on myself. That's just how when you begin to, 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 to meditate on the things of God and renew your mind, you think differently. That's right. You think differently. Right. He said, does a word ever come to your mind? You can rebuke it if it does come to your mind. That's what I'm saying. When you raise your standards, your ability to resist is strong. And so that's what you have to do is constantly raise your standard. Don't let it be something you, you do today and then next week you start lowering your standards again. No, it's something that you have to continue to do. Continue to keep your standards high by meditating on the word of God day and night. You're being proactive in the things of the spirit. Everybody say, I'm proactive, I'm proactive. in the things of the spirit. Now, when I say things of the Spirit, I'm talking about capital S, Spirit, the Spirit of God. So this is how you will resist the inordinate affections, even though you may have the temptations in your flesh. It don't mean you got to give in to every temptation. You don't have, anytime you give in to the temptation, that just means you're weak in that area, and you're going to have to what? Raise your standard. Everybody say raise your standard. Raise your standard. And how do we raise our standard? Once again, you're meditating on the Word. And you're constantly renewing your mind to the things of God. Amen? Amen? And then he will give you the mind of Christ. And it will be easier for you to resist those things. As a matter of fact, your affection will be toward God. And you will have less affection toward those things that are inordinate affection. You will have less of a desire for those things and more of a desire to do the things of God. Because when you're proactive in the things of God, you don't have time to fool with that other stuff. Amen. Come on now. Amen. Is this helping anybody today? Amen. Is this a blessing for you? No, I know I didn't do any hooping and all that, but I'm, I'm just hoping that by step by step you can see how we can deal with these scriptures that we see about inordinate affections and unnatural affection and, 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 and what's going on because all of us deal with temptation, don't we? Yes, we do. If you be honest, you are, you have temptation. But remember, temptation is not a sin. It's giving in to it. That's the sin. Do you understand? Temptation is not a sin, but giving in to it is the sin. I remember a time I used to say, God, take these affections away from me. Take this feeling away from me. Take this, you know, take this appetite away from me. And I found out that the appetite was supposed to be there. I just needed to know how to govern myself. I can control my action, and I can control me. I may not be able to control what I feel, but I learned that I can control what I do. Let us stand. I'll give the Lord another praise offering. You can control what you do when the Spirit of the Lord is in you. Without God's Spirit in you, you don't have any resistance. You don't have the ability to, to stop these things, even if you wanted to. I mean, you can, you can, you can do what they call willpower and, and those kind of things. You know, you can, you can, you can stop doing some things, but, but what you need to do is to make sure that you are secure eternally. See? The thing that we do is we come to Jesus and we give him our life so that we can be born again of his spirit. And when we're born again of his spirit, then the Lord lives his life through us. And right now, if you feel like there's some chains on you, chains of addictions, some inordinate affections that you seem like you, you just can't, can't fight them off. Because you can't in your flesh. You can't fight it off in your flesh. You need the spirit of the Lord. Just bow your head right now as we pray. Father, I believe that right now those chains can be broken off of somebody. Somebody right now, they may be bound by some addiction. Some, uh, maybe, maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's some, some other habits. Or maybe it's, 
is some of these same inordinate affections, uncleanness, and all that we've been looking at today. And Father, they, they may be struggling with these things. And they may be struggling with understanding of what is this. How come I can't get this off? And some maybe have never thought about they can be delivered. But today I pray in Jesus' name that we not try to fight so much the temptation, but to focus on drawing near to God. For you said, Lord, that when we draw near to you, that you draw near to us. And instead of us trying to fight off temptations and focusing on the temptation, help us to focus on you. Help us to put our minds on loving God. And as we love you, Lord, we know that the desire for those things diminish. So in the name of Jesus, draw us closer to you. Give us higher standards. Help us to desire the high standards that you have given to us, these high standards called holiness. And in Jesus' name, we know that we can walk up rightly before you and be pleasing in your sight. And we praise you for this. And everybody just say out loud and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know now, I know now that if you're with me, you with me I, can I can resist temptations. I don't have to fall into it, fall into it. And, be and be trapped in anything. But my love is for the Lord. And Lord, I want you to increase my love for you. As I'm studying your word. And meditating on you. And praying. Then I know. I get stronger and stronger. Every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You need to make that declaration over yourself.